Welcome to Worship on this Transfiguration Sunday. We're also excited that worship includes today a first Bible presentation to our second graders, so that will be coming up shortly. And this being Transfiguration Sunday, it means it's our last Sunday before we move into the season of Lent. So this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. There will be an online Ash Wednesday service emailed to you or you can find on the YouTube channel here. And come by the church for ashes. We're going to do drive through ashes and we'll be out there by the north doors of the church from 7 to 8 in the morning, noon to 1, and 5 to 6. So we hope we'll be able to see you at one of those times. And when you come by for ashes, um, we're, we're taking collections for two things this year in Lent. Uh, the first is soup, cans of soup, uh, to be donated to the Glen Ellen Food Pantry. And the other is a collection of socks, new socks, to be given to Exodus World Service. And that is also for awareness of Rock Your Socks World Down Syndrome Day. And there are a lot more details on all of that in the Dove. But now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we confess. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and the promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven in the wake of God's forgiveness. We are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This past week, myself, Pastor Shelley, and Pastor Joe had the privilege of hanging out with our second graders and teaching them about how to use their Bible. During this time, their parents gave them their new first Bibles that they will use going forward in their faith formation journey. Let's pray over them as they begin this journey in learning more about God's Word and diving deep into the scriptures. Will you bow your head and pray with me? Gracious God, we are so grateful for these second grade students and all the enthusiasm and excitement they bring. We pray for them as they receive their first Bibles. Help them to find in the pages of those Bibles your promise that you will love them always. Give them joy as they read your word. Be with these families as they grow together in their lives of faith and help us as a congregation to come alongside them and guide them in their faith formation journey. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A reading from 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory, glory to you, o Lord. Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud there came a voice, This is my Son, the Beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no, with, no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Happy Transfiguration Sunday and happy Valentine's Day. You know Valentine's Day has its roots in the church, February 14th being the feast day of St. Valentine. However, the history surrounding St. Valentine is murky. There were two, possibly three, church figures named Valentine throughout history. And the stories of each of them have been intermingled over time in such a way that it's not clear which details go with which Valentine and what is legend and what is history. However, what does rise to the top in the stories of St. Valentine is a theme of a love that is stronger than fear in the face of danger. 
That is a core truth of our faith, the essence of Jesus' life and death, and that we can celebrate on Valentine's Day. And that's all I'm going to say about Valentine's Day. Oh, except if you hold up Valentine's Day and Transfiguration Sunday, one has a reputation of not meeting expectations, and another was an event that exceeded expectations, was more than could have been imagined or expected. So that's my segue on to the Transfiguration. The Transfiguration account in Mark's Gospel begins with a time marker, six days later. That is, six days after Jesus had told the disciples of his death and resurrection. The disciples, particularly Peter, they didn't do so well getting their minds around that idea. So now, six days later, Jesus takes James, John, and Peter up a high mountain. In the Bible, holy and dramatic events often take place on mountaintops. So James, John, and Peter were probably expecting something, a prayerful, serene retreat with Jesus, maybe a sign from God. But what happened knocked them to their knees. First, Jesus' clothes became dazzling white, Mark says, such as no one on earth could bleach them. Does anyone else have a laundry reaction to that detail? I spend a good amount of time trying to get dirt, mud, food stains out of the family's laundry, and that detail impressed me. Wow, better and brighter than bleach? That's good. So, Jesus is suddenly appearing more divine than Peter and James and John had seen him. Then Elijah and Moses appear. Finally, God's presence come over, comes over all of them, and God speaks, naming the very thing they are witnessing. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. If you take one verse away from this passage, from this worship service, that would be a good one. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And then it's over. They've had this brilliant, strange, beyond imagination, shout your alleluias for the mountaintop experience, and then it's time to go back down the mountain. And down the mountain is, well, it's a lot of following Jesus around Galilee on dusty roads, hungry crowds, never-ending crowds of people bringing their sick to the marketplaces, begging Jesus that they might touch even his cloak. There were healings, teaching miracles the disciples witnessed for sure, but there is lots of hard stuff too. And it gets harder from here. When they go down the mountain, it won't be long until they walk with Jesus to Jerusalem and his death. We enter into Lent this week, and in doing so, we begin to follow Jesus' journey again to Jerusalem and death. And in that, we name and we sit with the reality that life has a lot of hard stuff, a lot of traveling weary roads. So in Lent, we put our alleluias away for a while, literally and metaphorically. And we sit more quietly with heartache, sorrow, sin, its consequences in our lives and in the world, in the systems we move in and benefit from. We sit with pain and shame and the ways they can bind us. We sit with the reality of death. And when we really sit in those spaces, it's too much. It can be paralyzing in thought and action, <clears throat> or too much, so we just find, try to find a way push it all aside. But then, then we watch Jesus take all of this sin, shame, pain, hate, death into his arms and walk up another mountain to put them to death for us. To show us, <clears throat> to show us that even at the grave, we can make our alleluias. And that word alleluia, it means praise the Lord. But it isn't a flippin' easy kind of thing. A true alleluia is one that is proclaimed in defiance. It's an alleluia we find on the other side of the cross. 
an alleluia that says no disease, destruction, or brokenness, or death is beyond God's reach. So we will move this week from Transfiguration today into Lent as our way of coming back down the mountain or saying, down the mountain is where we are. And we'll face the hard stuff because we know none of it is beyond God's reach. God is love incarnate, a love that defies fear in the face of danger. Alleluia. Oh, and one last thing. There's actually something related to our alleluias that we have to do. Last year, we were in church all together on Transfiguration Sunday. And the kids made alleluia ribbons to wave in worship. And then at the end of worship, they brought those up and we locked them in a big trunk. Not the kids, the alleluia ribbons. But then the kids helped us carry the trunk out of the sanctuary and we hid it. With the plan, ha, ah, the plan, that we'd open the trunk on Easter and pull out the alleluias and celebrate. That didn't happen. And those alleluias have been sitting untouched where we hid them a year ago. So I think we need to find them now. Except I don't remember where we hid them. Pastor Joe, do you know? Kayla, do you remember where we hid them? I wish we had some of the kids here to help us. I think we're just going to have to go look for them. I give up. I couldn't find them last year. I can't find them this year. I don't know that we'll find our hallelujahs. Yeah. Wait, I remember. They're in here. Oh, it's so gross. Wow, oh, that's, that's, some, that's some dust. I see a dead fly. Good enough. <laughs> I think so.
With the whole church, we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all in need. For the gospel proclaimed in word and deed, for communities of faith far and near, and for all who show the face of Christ throughout the world, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For creation, sun, moon, and stars, life forming in the dark earth and ocean deep, mountains, clouds, and storms, and creatures seen and unseen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those responsible for safety and protection, for emergency responders and security guards, attorneys and advocates, civil servants and leaders of government, that they witness to mercy and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who suffer this day, that Christ, our healer, transforms sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For companions on life's journey in this worshiping community, for loved ones who cannot be with us, and for guidance during struggles we face, that God's glory is revealed around and among us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their earthly pilgrimage, that their lives of service and prayer inspire us in our living. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken and silent. For the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As we turn now to the table, we have a moment of giving thanks. I want to give thanks to you in this offering moment for your continued support of all of our ministry here. As we turn to a new season in the church, as we hope the turn of the season is right around the corner in the world. We give thanks for you and all you do to support everything that goes into the life of faith at faith. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O holy God. You are life and light of all. By your powerful word you created all things. Through your prophets you called your people to be a light to the nations. Blessed are you for Jesus, your Son. He is your light shining in our darkness, revealing to us your mercy and might. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. As we remember his preaching and healing, his dying and rising, and his promise to come again, we await that day when all the universe will rejoice in your holy and life-giving light. By your Spirit, bless this meal, that refreshed with this heavenly food, we may be a light for the world, revealing the brilliance of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours. Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, 
in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Knowing how great God's love is for us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to find your communion supplies. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. We pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet nourished in body and in spirit to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. Hear these words of blessing. God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace now and always. Amen. Go in peace, share the gift of Jesus. Thanks be to God.